you. Lord, we love you. We're amazed by you. And I pray that we have a mighty roar in this place of worshiping you and honoring you and glorifying you, that you would be celebrated in this house. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. We love you in your precious holy name. Come on, amen. Amen. So good you may have a seat. Praise the Lord. Come on, we thank, thank you for our worship team, please. Come on. Come on. And man, just know they're going to be here all day, and they are going to be getting ready for tonight. They're going to hang some, some, some uh, crowd mics for us so that, I mean, they asked, like, Sean, we really want to hear you. We want to hear you sing because we know your voice is God-given. I mean, Olivia got it from somewhere, right? So they're like, listen, we just want to mic you up, and just you can be a part of the live production. That's what they were saying. Like, Sean, it would be great because, and, and. They're like, no, we just, Sean, you need to calm down. We just need everybody else to be singing. That's what we need. So um, Seek tonight is going to be special, man. We're, there's just already some great energy around it. There's already some great excitement around it. And uh, I believe we're going to have a powerful, truly a powerful night, um, powerful night tonight. So don't miss that, please. But we have a, a worship team that puts the time in. And it's not just, they just don't show up 7 o'clock on a Sunday they're here Thursday, but yet they're spending time with Jesus through the week and getting it right with Christ and spending time with him and in his presence. And then it just shows up and there's just a wonderful, beautiful presence of God in this house. Uh, it's because we have an anointed group of, of musicians and singers and voices and just I'm very, very thankful for our worship team. I'm very proud of our worship team. They put a lot of time in and they'll be here probably most of this day. I'm um, seven o'clock on and just ripping. So just to have a night tonight that's going to be a great night. So we're thankful. Be thankful for the work. And a special shout goes out to Michael Smith, uh, Paige Smith, Jade Smith, Brendan Miller. They have spent hours and hours and hours, literally weeks, uh, putting together a whole new light system. We'll have this for, for a long time. And uh, this is just brilliant. When Mike gets on a project, it's truly his genius and his brilliance comes out. And, and I mean that. Like there's... It's just tremendous on what he has the ability to do and the capabilities of, of our new lighting system and just create atmosphere and a great presence, and we're super thankful. Can we say thank you to Mike Smith, please? And, and, and his, his daughters and Brendan have spent so much, so much time, so much time here, and we're just so grateful that he is a part of this house because he has done so much for this house. Um, Believers Chapel, I love you. And, we, and it's just I've been looking forward to this weekend for a quite a time. You've got the men's retreat. We're juiced about that. And then just come in uh, today and just be able to continue on this consistency brings victory. And then tonight for Seek, um, and I'm just, I'm full and I'm, I'm so excited uh, for, th for this moment. And uh, this week and next week, we'll be speaking on faith and uh, looking forward to, to change in faith and looking forward to a, to a faith that we have and, and a faith that is going to grow. And a faith that we just see just the greatness of God and just truly how great and mighty our God is. To really believe God is great. And when our faith is based off of a level of God's greatness, then we come to the, this, this understanding of what it is to trust him. Faith means to trust. Faith means to believe. Faith means to depend on and rely on. So if I am, I'm saying I need a great level of faith and I need to trust and depend on him in the good, the bad, and the ugly, whether it's going right or whether it's going wrong, whether it didn't go my way, but I know that God knows all things and God, I trust you and I need to walk in this level of faith no matter what season of life I'm in, yet God, I will trust you. Where's that level of faith? I'm going to go through uh, several different beautiful Bible stories that Jesus has these encounters with these people. And you see where Jesus will either label you as little faith or Jesus will label you as great faith. We're going to do this for two weeks. This week we're looking at two Bible stories. We're not going to get to all four. I tried that in the first service and we got through two. So we'll be 50% done today and we'll finish it next week. It'll be amazing. But we're going to look at these true Bible stories, these amazing stories that Jesus has these encounters with these individuals and with these people that he labels you either great faith or little faith. And when you see this, it's just, it's stunning. It's stunning. Say, Lord, I want to have great faith. 
I want to trust you no matter what the circumstances are. And I want to come, and then I'm going to come again, and then I'm going to come again, and I'm going to keep coming, and I'm going to keep pressing, and I'm going to keep coming. And God, I want to be one who is identified by great faith because God, you, you are moved. Watch this, watch this. You are moved by faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith saves us, right? We know that faith is a pleasing agent from God. It's impossible to please God without faith. We know that. But we also got to understand this, the level of our faith that moves God. It moves God. So I want us to look at this and let's just pray. And I'm just asking that today, let your heart be open and be ready for this today. I'm praying for good soil today. I'm praying that your heart has been tilled throughout the week. And no matter what season that we are in, no matter where we're at, whether, yes, I trust God because everything is going great, or we, we understand, God, I'm in a rough season, man. It's been a rough patch, but yet, God, I'm holding on, and I keep coming, and I keep coming, and I keep coming, and I keep coming, and God, I want to have this great faith. Whatever it is, man, it is my hope, and it is my desire that we would be in this place today to say, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready to hear it. God, speak to me in this moment that there will begin this climb of faith that God will see something take place today. And then we come back tonight for seek and then we climb again in our faith. Just seek is all about faith. It's all about just march God. No matter what takes place this month, I trust you. That's faith. But my hope is this, that we come with a, a ready heart and a ready spirit to say, God, I've tilled my heart. Man, my soil is ripe. It's ready. And God, that you would allow your seed, your word to sit in my in my soil, and in my, in my, in my, in this ground that's ready, and in that, the Bible says that there will be an effect, man. There will be an increase. There will be fruit. Come on, let's just pray, Lord. I thank you so much for this moment, and I thank you for this time that we have. We thank you for worship. We pray that you are acknowledged in this house and worship. But God, we pray as we get into your Word, God, that you would feed us this morning. That the soil is ready and the soil is right, and as your seed falls on that soil, it would grow, and there would be great fruit. God, help our faith. We love you. Man, church, ask God. Say, God, speak to me today. My heart is right. God, I'm ready. I want to hear from you today. God, I need to hear from you today. Speak to me today. And I'll respond to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Come on, turn me, please, to Matthew 14. Turn me, please, to Matthew 14. This is, this is one of those truly stunning stories. You hear it, you see it. You know, there's, there's pictures about this. It's just, this is just one of those stories that you can zip by it until you kind of stop and park, right? I want to stop and park in this story and try to unpack this a little bit um, from an amazement point of view, right? This is a story that Jesus walks on water. And we just say, yeah, we know Jesus walked on water. Yeah, so did Peter. And I know that Peter sank. But man, like when you, when you begin to understand that, that we have this, right? We have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. We have everything that we need to know. We see who God is. We see his power. We see his authority. We see his greatness. We see, we see the creation and we know that God is great. Right? We, we have all that. It's all written down for us. Disciples only had the Old Testament. Disciples didn't have the New Testament because they are the New Testament. They're the ones writing it down for us to see these amazing works of Christ. So you've got to see this. Like You've got Jesus walking on water, and, and, and you've got to understand this story is about a bunch of fishermen in a boat. They've never seen this. Nobody's ever seen this ever happen, ever on the planet Jesus Christ, who is the creator, is walking on his creation that no one else has ever been able to walk on before in the history of mankind is a lake that's moving, not ice, but a lake that's alive, right? A lake that's moving, a lake that has no ice on it, a lake that has just water on it, and there's waves, and it's going crazy, and then there's Jesus. Then there's Jesus walking on water, doing something that no one has ever done, and Jesus walking on that which he created, which has never been ever created and made to be walked on, but Jesus is walking on that which is impossible. And these fishermen see something in the sea that they've never seen before. And they're stunned. And they're frightened. 
and we see that it's just, it's just Jesus. Walking on that which he created, which has never been meant to walk on. And we unpack this because this is this incredible story. We see it in verse 22, 14, 22, Matthew 14, verse 22 says this immediately. I love that, immediately. What a great, powerful word. You know what immediately means? It means now, right now, immediately, active. Like in this instance, immediately. This is important. When we go into this for the next couple of weeks, you begin to see this word repeat immediately. When Jesus acted, there were times that it was immediate. When Jesus healed, there were times that it was immediate. When Jesus worked, there were times that it was immediate. And this is one of those times is immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And while he sent the crowds away, I love this, while he sent the crowds away, like immediately he made his disciples. You got to remember the disciples were the fishermen, right? This is what they did. This was their livelihood. They lived on the sea. They fished on the sea. This was their business. They knew the sea. They knew waves. They they knew what it was to be on the sea. These, These were professionals, right? The disciples get in the boat, go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself. I love that. By himself to pray and And when it was evening, he was there alone. Jesus is like this. Guys, I need you to get in the boat, right? I'm going to do the closing out ceremony. Like I'm going to, I'm going to maybe do some praying, do what we need to do, send the people away. I need you to get in the boat and I need you to start getting to the other side. I'm going to, I need some space, man. I need some time with my father. You guys go to the other side. I'm going to send the crowns away. And what Jesus does next, he goes up onto the mountain and he just spends time in the presence of his father. And he just begins to cry out and he begins to pray to the father. And all this while the dudes are in the boat and they're rowing the boat, trying to get to the other side. And where's Jesus? Jesus is in a prayer meeting with the father. Like Jesus is on the mountain all by himself, having this amazing moment with the father, crying out to the father, praying to the father, right? And then you see this verse 24, the dudes are working, man. The dudes are rowing. The dudes are, and this is nighttime. So the dudes are in the boat and they're rowing. Verse 24, but the boat was already a long distance from the shore. Was it battered by the waves for the wind was contrary. The wind was coming against them. So here you see that these guys are just, just busting, man. And the Bible says this, verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, the fourth watch of the night is between three and 6 a.m. So this is nighttime. It's dark, right? It's windy and waves, which means the moon probably wasn't out. Could you, have you ever, I mean, how many know what it is to be out in the ocean or out even on a lake or out without any houses, but out in the sea somewhere when there is no moon and it's just pitch black? Crazy, right? So here you've got these guys, the wind is rowing, coming against them and they're working and they're working and the waves are crashing against the boat and it's dark and they're working and they're working and they're working. And then all of a sudden between three and 6 a.m. here, what takes place? This is crazy. And in the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Guys, listen, I need you to get in the boat. I need you to go to the other side. I'm going to do the closeout meeting. I'm going to send the people away. And then he goes up to the mountain, you know, spends his time with the father. He's praying and, and, and you got to get this Jesus walking on the water. I don't know his speed. I don't know if he's in a sprint. I don't know if he's floating. Like, I don't know. Like if, you know, like you ever seen flash, like water spitting up behind him. Like, I don't know if that's Jesus like running on the water like that, but the Bible says he's walking on water. So however he got from the shore to where they're at, Jesus is just walking on the water, which is significant to them rowing the boat. And they're just, they're fighting the waves, man. They're fighting the wind and they're putting everything they can. And all of a sudden they see this figure like they've never seen before in every day they've ever been on the sea. They've never seen a figure before walking toward them on a sea like a man. This has never been done in the history. And we read this story like we've read it a hundred times. Put yourself in that boat. Try to unpack what's going through these fishermen. Try to unpack what's going through the disciples that they are now experiencing something that they have never, ever seen in any moment ever in a boat before. And they reflect this in verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. 
When you go deep into this word terrified, it means they were paralyzed with fear. So here they see this, this man figure walking on water. The Bible tells us that they were paralyzed. And I don't know if they did one of these, like are we seeing things, are we delirious? Like, what, what, do you see, what, hey, what is that? Is that, that, that Loch Ness? Like, what is, like, is that, that the mystery? Like, is that, you know, like, are they elbowing each other? Like when one first sees it, are they like, what, what, is, what is that? Like, dude, that's a man. I can't be a man. He's walking like he's floating on the water. Like he can't like, no, dude, I'm telling you, that's a man. Like that, and then I don't know. Like this is the real story with real dudes and somebody saw him first. Like, are you kidding me? Like, what is that? Like, what, what is that? Like, if I'm in a boat with my friends, I'm like going, hey, what are you like? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, am I up? Am I been up too long? Am I to like, what? No, dude, that is a man. Well, what's he doing? He's walking on what? The water. But where is his boat? Doesn't have one. What's he doing? He's walking on what? What, what is going? Like, they were, they were frightened. They were terrified to a place of being paralyzed. This is a real story. How did these guys respond to seeing this man walking on water, right? They were terrified and they said, it is a ghost. Like it has, this is how real this was to them. This is a ghost or this is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. I love that. They cried out in fear. Bunch of dudes in a boat, terrified, paralyzed, screaming, from a place of fear. But immediately, there's that word again, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, I love this. They've been with Jesus. They know Jesus. They've seen Jesus work. They've seen Jesus do miracles. They've heard Jesus preach. And then Jesus speaks. Take courage. Like, be bold. Be courageous. It is I. Do not be afraid. I, I love this where he sees that they, I mean, he would imagine, right? Jesus knows all things. He knows they're freaking out, right? They, he knows that they're screaming. He knows that they are terrified. He knows that some of them are just in this place of, ha, what? No, ha, like it's a ghost. It's a spirit. What's going on? Like they're just, they're just freaking out in the boat, right? And Jesus is like, hey, take courage. Be courageous. It is I. What amazing words. It is I. Do not be afraid. Here they knew the voice of Jesus, and I love this, but yet you have Peter. Verse 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, I love that. It is I. Lord, if it's you. Hey, Peter, I just said it was I. Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And she's like, all right. Come on. Like, I love that, right? Like we know that Jesus knows all things, right? And he's like, one of my disciples, watch this. Like Jesus probably talked to himself, like, hey, Holy Spirit, like talking to himself, right? Hey, God, talking to himself, like, hey, watch, I know what's about to happen. Like Peter's gonna bid to come and I'm gonna shock him by saying come. Like you're not gonna know what to do. It's gonna be amazing, right? So Peter's like, hey, if it's you, bid me to come. Like, which, again, you got to try to unpack this, this story. Like, okay, if it's not Jesus, Peter, you guys are freaking out because you think it's an evil spirit. You don't think the evil spirit could say, oh, come on. Like, I'd be like Peter, what are you thinking with that, right? Hey, if it's you, bid me to come. Like, if an evil spirit says, yeah, just come. And, oh, okay, great. Like, you got to put, put yourself here, right? So Peter gets bid to come by the Lord. This is incredible, right? So here you've got Peter, verse 26. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost crying out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, take courage at his eye, do not be afraid. And then Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Church, this is amazing. Jesus is like, again, the waves are going crazy, right? The wind is going crazy. It's dark. And you've got Peter trying to get out of the boat. 
And then you could imagine he steps out on the boat and then he's just like, check this out, guys. I'm like, like, hey, John, you see this? Like, come on, this is, this is, hey, Andrew, hey, bro, you see what I'm doing? Like, you know the brothers, right? Andrew, do you see what I'm doing? Like, you ain't, you ain't out here, you ain't doing this. And like, just, you know how dudes talk, you know how brothers talk, right? And he's like, I'm walking towards Jesus, right? And he's, I mean, like, like Peter is zeroed in, man. Peter is focused. He's looking at Jesus and he's zeroed in. And he's actually walking on water. And when you realize this has never been done again. And watch this. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came towards Jesus. Verse 30, here it is. But seeing the wind... When you're on a body of water, how do you see wind? It's the waves. Got to remember the waves were crashing against the boat and the wind <clears throat> was so harsh that it was causing them to work so hard because it was causing all of these waves. And here you've got Peter, it's Jesus. Like, and again, church, these are dudes, like there's adrenaline, right? And you're like, Jesus, wow, this is Jesus. And you're, just, you're no longer focused on the waves, you're focused on Jesus. He gets out of the boat, he begins to walk on water towards Jesus. And then all of a sudden, watch this, but seeing the wind, Peter became frightened and beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. Beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. And watch Jesus. Immediately, there it is the third time, immediately. Look how close he was, church. I don't know how far off this was. I don't know what it looked like on how far Peter was walking. I don't know where Jesus was, but Jesus had to be in a place where they could see him, right? And they had to be in a spot where Peter could get out and walk towards him. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the waves got to him. All of a sudden, the wind got to him. Something took place where he was reminded, watch this, watch this, watch this. He was reminded of his circumstances. Ever been there where you just, you're zeroed in on Jesus and things are going great. Watch this and you're focused and you're doing things. You're like, man, my faith is strong and I'm doing this great thing and I'm zeroed in on focus. And then all of a sudden something happens. All of a sudden something happens and you are reminded of the circumstance that you have been in. Peter was on the sea. The sea was raging. The wind was crazy. The waves crashing against the boat. This is where Peter was. He gets out of the boat, same circumstance. Nothing has changed. And he zeroed in on Jesus and then all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, he's reminded of a circumstance. He's reminded going, what am I doing? It's just, this is crazy. This is in the middle of a storm. This is in the middle of the sea. This is in the middle of the waves. They're starting to crash against my, my thighs. The wind is trying to push against me. And now I am reminded of what are you? What am I doing? And he became frightened. And in that moment when fear, watch this, watch what it says. When fear took over, what took place? He began to sink. Church, when fear takes over, you begin to sink. He became frightened. And then he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, help me. Do we see, do we see where we're at? Circumstances are crazy. We get zeroed in on Jesus. We look to Jesus and start having great faith. And then all of a sudden we're reminded of our circumstances, which were there all along. And then fear took over and we begin to sink. The Bible says this, look at this. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, verse 31. Look how close he was. Look how close he was. And took hold of him and said to him, watch what he says. This is, this is a stunning statement. You of little faith. I, I just... I just walked on what no one will ever be able to say they've done that in the history of mankind. No one has ever been able to say they walked on water. 
doesn't that account for anything? I was zeroed in on you. I was focused on you. I was coming towards you. I was walking on water. You have little faith. Then Jesus asks the question, why did you doubt? And amazing that Peter doesn't answer. He has now got his hand out to Jesus and Jesus' hand out to him as he's sinking and he's right there before greatness. He's right there before the creator, the very one who created the sea. And Jesus asks the question, why did you doubt? And Peter has no answer. And then they go back to the boat. And you see the guys in the boat just begin, as, as they got into the boat, the Bible says the wind stopped, man. So all of this was taking place throughout this amazing, this amazing picture of Jesus and Peter. And then all of a sudden, there's just this immediate calm. And all the brothers in the boat are like, whoa. Man, they begin to worship him and they're amazed by him. But it's incredible to me that Jesus looks at Peter just after this amazing stunt that, that Peter gets out of the boat and actually is walking on water and then gets frightened and walks. Now fears controlling me begins to sink and Jesus says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? So your level of doubt really looks to the level of your faith and your level of fear. You can look to the level of your faith. When Jesus commands us to be courageous, commands us, do not fear, do not be afraid. When doubt begins to creep in, our faith begins to get less. See the lesson here, church. Unpack this biblical truth. Peter, why did you doubt? You were doing great. You have little faith. I was right there. I was right there. Why did you let fear creep in? Why did you let doubt take over your spirit? Now let's see this, another picture of this. Just turn the page, Matthew 15. That's an example of Jesus crying out to an individual who has little faith, but yet he did great things. And it's in that moment, please hear this. It's in that moment, whether you have little faith or great faith is what your level of, of fear is and what your level of doubt is. You could be doing great. You could be doing great. You're zeroed in on Jesus, yet circumstances are going crazy all around you. And you're like, listen, I'm going to praise him through my problem. I'm going to worship him through my worry. And I'm going to just get my focus on him. Man, I see my faith is strong. I'm feeling good, even though the circumstances haven't changed. Man, I'm doing great in my faith and things are going good. And I'm feeling good. Jesus and me, man, me and Jesus are doing good. And my faith is good. Yeah, but I'm just seeing everything around you is going crazy. I know, but it's all good. My circumstances haven't changed. But yet my faith in him is good. I'm not going to walk my doubt. I'm not even afraid. Yeah, but didn't you get the doctor's report, yeah, I know my circumstances haven't changed, but my faith is in them. And then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, someone comes along and speaks something stupid. And then all of a sudden, you take your eyes off of Jesus and you bought into some report because some person spoke something in you that caused you to doubt. And all of a sudden, we see it, church. I see it happen. All of a sudden, fear grips those who were once so strong. And doubt settles in. Their circumstances haven't changed. But now all of a sudden they're not walking so strong and they're not worshiping where they need to worship. They're not praising where they need to praise it. They're not acknowledging with gratitude before the Lord. They're not trusting and they're now doubt has shown up. And all of a sudden you can see, you can see, you can see the words. Why did you doubt? I had you right where I wanted you. So when you see that your level of faith really is attached to your level of doubt and your level of fear, 
because we see this amazing picture of an individual, a woman, and she knows, watch this, she knows she has no business coming before the Lord. She Canaanite woman, she's a Gentile woman, she knows, she knows, she's heard, she's seen something. And I love this picture because here even this, this Canaanite woman who, who she understands, I know I have no business coming before you. As, 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 and she calls him the son of David, which is an Old Testament term for the Messiah. Somehow, some way, she knew. This man can cure my daughter. I know that this is the one who is the son of David. Somehow she had faith to believe that he was the Messiah. And this is a stunning story as you unpack the simple few verses here. You look at verse 22, it says this in Matthew 15. And a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, have mercy on me, Lord. I love this. Began to cry out, have mercy, have compassion on me, Lord. She, listen, she, somehow she's seen his compassion. Somehow she's heard of his mercy. And he's had mercy on Gentiles before. We've seen him heal Gentiles before this woman. So somehow she knew, man, if he has compassion on me like he's, like he's had on others, I know he'll move on my behalf. And this woman is desperate. This woman is desperate for her daughter. And she cries out, have mercy or have compassion on me, Lord, son of David. There's the identifier, son of David. For my daughter is cruelly demon possessed. I mean, if someone was to come and say, man, my daughter is demon possessed, I'd be like, okay, whoo, there's a lot. There's a lot to that picture that comes to heart biblically. Like, wow, that's just okay, demon possession. They're, they're not in their right mind. They're screaming and yelling and, and, and like doing crazy things and have great power. But then when she adds, my daughter is cruelly, she adds that to demon possessed. Like demon possessed isn't enough that this, this demon that is possessing my daughter is cruel to her. Now put your shoes in a mother's heart to see your daughter being cruelly treated by a demon. And this woman's got nowhere else to go. Have mercy on me. Son of David, I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. And I need your help. My, de my daughter is being cruelly treated by a demon. I got nowhere else to go. And watch Jesus' response. But he did not answer her a word. I mean, church, when you... you try to look at this of our understanding of Jesus Christ who is good who is compassionate heals the brokenhearted we see story after story after story of his compassion we see story after story of his mercy we see story after story of, of those who were put out and those who were lonely and those who there where's Jesus he's going after the one man Jesus is going after and we see it and we see it and we see it and here this woman who is who is just desperate comes to Jesus pours out her heart to Jesus and he doesn't even acknowledge her you can read this story and say what is going on Jesus, what is happening with you? You, know, you can look at this and say, man, Jesus, you having a bad day? You, you tired of just healing people? You tired of everybody wanting a piece of Jesus? Everybody's coming to Jesus, large crowds. Everybody wants something from Jesus. Jesus, you tired of that? Jesus, you saying, I'm done with this. You had a bad day? This woman, it's broken for her daughter. You don't give her the time of day. Matter of fact, you don't even acknowledge her existence. 
What? But that's, that's what it is. Look at this. He did not answer her a word. And we know this is absolute true that Jesus never has a bad day. That Jesus is full of compassion and mercy and grace. And we know that Jesus loves this woman. So why would he not even acknowledge her? And then it gets worse. Then the disciples come to Jesus. His disciples came and begged him. They implored him, which means they begged him saying, send her away because she just, she just keeps shouting at us. Jesus, would you just send her away? She just keeps coming. She just keeps shouting at us. Like you could imagine from a broken mom's heart, she's shouting and crying out for help. Would you get him to help me, please? Like, I don't, we don't know what she's shouting, but we know she's in anguish. What would you shout, mom? Mom, what would you shout when you know that one right there is my only answer? I'm trying to get through the disciples. Listen, you get to them. You go to them. Tell them, I just need a minute. I want him to help me. Maybe you're trying to define what's going on with your daughter. I don't know. But the disciples, we know this. They're tired of her. Would you do something, Lord? Would you do send her away? Do something? Because she just keeps shouting at us. I just see this as a desperate mom. Doing whatever it takes to get to the son of David. Church, what happens when you're desperate? There's not another answer. And then Jesus answers the disciples and he says this to them. He says, as I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus is saying, my priority truly is the children of Israel. My priority is God's chosen. And we see that Jesus isn't saying you know, I'm never going to do anything with the Gentiles. We know that we as Gentiles are certainly loved uh, with a love that is inexpressible by God. We know that Jesus has already done an amazing work on, on, on Gentiles and miracles with Gentiles and loves Gentiles. But this, he's just making this priority point to the disciples saying, listen, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then you see it again where she comes and began to bow down before him saying, Lord, help me. I love this. Lord, help me. And then he answers her. Listen to the answer here. You'd think it would be like, okay, I've heard your cry. But he answers her this crazy response. And again, you're just like, what are you doing? This is her answer. She's bowed down before him. She's on knees before him saying, Lord, help me. And the Lord answers and said, it's not good to take the children's bread, meaning God's chosen people, children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Could you imagine her listening to that? She's on knees before the very one that can help. Lord, help me. Listen, it's not good for me to take the, the bread of, of the children of Israel and give it to the dogs. And this, this, this woman just continues to press and this woman just continues to seek and this woman just continues to go before the Lord and her response, church, don't miss it, her response is stunning. Listen, she knows her place. She knows what it is to be a, a Canaanite woman to be before the Lord. She knows all this, but yet she comes and she comes anyways. She gets past the disciples. After already, watch this, after already not even being acknowledged by the Lord, then getting through the disciples, then coming before him on knees saying, Lord, help me. And he says, listen, it's not right for the bread of the children of Israel to go to the dogs. And then listen, look at her response. It's incredible. Her response is 27, but she said, yes, Lord. She's like, I get it. But even the dogs 
feet on the crumbs which fall just, from the master's table. Church, this woman is in such a place. Saying, I'll just take a crumb. I'll just take a crumb. That's all I need from you. There are times that even the dogs get the crumbs just from the master's table. That's all I need. I'll just take a crumb. And I personally believe that this was, this was the setup. Jesus knew what was gonna take place. Jesus knew this woman was coming. Jesus knew the disciples were watching. And when this woman showed such honor and truly such love and such an understanding of whom she was before, who, who she was kneeling before, and she just kept pressing. I, I know, I know, I just need a crumb. It's amazing. Honestly, do we come to the Lord like that? I know I don't deserve anything. But Lord, all I need is a crumb. I'm gonna keep coming. I'm gonna show honor. I'm gonna show great reverence. I know whom I'm before. All I need is just a crumb. And then watch Jesus. Church, faith moves God. Faith moves the heart of God. And Jesus says this, O woman, your faith is great. Your faith is great. You came, I ignored you. You knew I was a God of mercy. You knew, somehow you knew, you cried out to me to have mercy, but I said nothing. You came and I said, listen, I'm here to focus on who I'm here to focus on, the children of God. You came and I said, listen, my, my bread, my time's gotta go to them. And you came. He said, just give me a crumb. And he says, oh woman, your faith. Your dependence, your reliance, your belief, and your trust. It has trumped all of your doubts. And it has trumped all of your fears and you just kept coming. Your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Church, what is the difference between little faith and great faith? Come on, if we just stand to our feet, please. I want us to not walk in a, a level of doubt, a level of fear, but I want us to come again and again and again before the Lord. Say, Lord, all I need is a crumb. I know that's enough. And I don't come with fear. I don't come with doubt. I want to have great faith. I want to have great faith. I want to just bow your heads just for a minute. Like, where are you in this this morning? First, do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Like, do, do you truly know Jesus? Because that's where faith has to begin with an understanding of Jesus Christ. That's where faith begins.
That's where faith begins. Do you, have you trusted in Christ as Savior? Man, have you, have you acknowledged sin? Because sin is what separates us from God. Jesus Christ had to come pay the price for sin. So first, it's the sin issue. First, we have to admit and acknowledge sin. And then we acknowledge that which dealt with sin. It was Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for you and I on a cross that dealt with the sin issue, but it's on us to know and to believe and to trust that that's true. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I trust in you. When someone asks you, Sean, what's your faith? If my answer is anything other than my faith is that I was a sinner and Jesus Christ, who was perfect, left heaven, put on flesh, put himself on a cross to sacrifice for my sin. And then he was buried and raised and conquered death, hell and the grave. And in that, that's my faith. My faith is not my church attendance. My faith is not my religion class. My faith is not found in me doing good. My faith is not in my good works. My faith is not being never arrested. My faith is in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. That and only that is considered to be my faith. Amen. So where is your faith? It's not in church attendance. It's not in your tithe and offering check. It's not in your good works. It's not in your good marriage. It's not in your good kids. It's not in the religion class. It's in Jesus. And I love it where the Lord never made it complicated. He said, number one, admit your sinner. Acknowledge your sin. And acknowledge all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. Acknowledge my sin has caused me to fall short of heaven. But Jesus Christ put himself on a cross to pay for my sin. And I believe in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. And thirdly, man, I confess that he is my Lord. Man, with heads bowed, just come to a place this morning. If you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, say, Jesus, I admit my sin. I acknowledge you as Lord today. I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. I trust in your sacrifice. I believe in you. Fill me with your spirit today. And I confess that you are my Lord. I surrender. I need you, Jesus, today. Forgive me of my sin. I surrender. And last thing is this, and we'll sing and then we'll, we'll bounce. Now, where's your faith today? Say, God, I want great faith. I don't want to doubt. I don't want to walk in fear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. When you get the proper picture of the greatness of our God and really know it and believe it, your faith will begin to increase. You'll see how great our God is. And that is where will be the, the level of our faith. So trust in him today. Let your faith rise. Ask God, increase my faith. Show me strong faith. And help me to climb that ladder of faith today. Lord, we love you. We're amazed by you. We honor you here. I thank you for every person who is here today. Father, I pray that you bless us and keep us and let your face shut upon us as we go. Lord, bless tonight at Seek. Bless our time at Seek tonight. Fill this house that we want to honor you and walk by faith tonight. In Jesus' name.